The message of the church is Jesus. It is not self-help because you can't help you. In fact, you're, thank you so much. Man, you bless me. Uh, you cannot help yourself, amen? Um, but Jesus can, and you can't get yourself out of sin. You can't get yourself out the mess, but you've got a God who can. James chapter 5, we've been going through the book of James. Let me show you this, and then next week, just uh, kind of wrap up today, and then next week show you something out of the life of Elijah, which James talks about. want to just look at what James says about the Lord's healing hand. And the Bible has so many famous healings. Remember, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Uh, Peter and John going into the temple when the, the lame man said, can you, can you give me anything? And they said, look at us. Silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And at that moment, what's amazing about the healing of Jesus is it is always, it was very instant. That is immediately the legs were made strong, the, the tendons came together, the muscle was built, and the man stood up and he began to leap and he followed them into the, the temple. Remember, Paul went, remember this, Paul was preaching one time and there was a guy by the name of Eutychus had climbed up in a window and was sitting up in that second story window and he got a little sleepy while the preacher was preaching. I don't know why. And after he, you remember this? He fell asleep and fell out of the window and died, which makes every preacher feel better about bad sermons because we're like, hey, nobody ever died while I was preaching, Paul. Uh, but Paul ran around outside, raised him, from the dead. I love that. And there's, there's so many stories that just come to mind when you think about healing. Um, listen to this from James 5. Look down there at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? You go, yeah, that's some of us. Let him pray. And then he says, if you're cheerful, what should you do? Sing praises, which you just did. Blue verse 14. Is any of you, what does he ask there? Sick. Pause and ask this. Why is there sickness in in a world that we have. It wasn't supposed to be. By the way, I uh, say, why is there sickness? According to my family, because I don't drink enough water, which is not true. I drink water. I mean, I drink coffee and tea, which I count as water. There's water included. Um, or they say, you know, David, you don't eat protein. So that's, uh, let me give you a biblical reason why there is sickness and death. Uh, the Bible tells us that there is sickness in our world because of sin. That when Adam and Eve sinned against God, it brought death into our world. Genesis 3, 19, God said to them, dust you are, dust you will become. Cursed, and then he says this, cursed is the ground because of you. And because of that sin, all of, um, all, all of the world stands under a curse. Everything, the animals, that you've never really seen animals. Animals stand under a curse. Uh, vegetarian, am I right? Vegetable, uh, the, the vegetarian, the vegetarian, the vegetarian, vegetation is under a curse. Uh, the plants are, am I right? The plants are under a curse. The, look, everything that is, including, hey, smile, including your body, you're like, I kind of suspected something was up. We stand under a curse. Um, hey, let me just explain your world to you. Starbucks is under a curse. Oh, that made sense. Uh, for, anyway, sometimes the Bible tells us that there is sin because of satanic attack. Remember God, God and Job talking, and Job said, flesh for flesh. If I st allow me to strike his flesh. Peter uh, was talking to Jesus, and Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Good news and bad news. Uh, Satan has to ask God before he can attack. The, that, that, that's the good news is he has to ask. The bad news is God might say yes. Uh, sometimes there is sickness in the Bible because of discipline, that God brings discipline, and it's one of the ways that God will discipline us. Paul said to the Corinthian church, some of you have died because of the way that you have mishandled the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you remember in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead when they stood for, before Peter, and he said, dare you lie to the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in Acts 22, it says that that Herod was speaking and they said, this is the voice of a God. And because he did not give praise to God, he was struck dead and eaten by worms. I always imagined that as a kid more fantastic than I think it really. Uh, I imagined that this was like attack of the killer worms, that worms came out and just, <laughs> it probably means that he got worms and died. 
But I'll check the video when I get there and, and tell you how that. Uh, remember in, uh, in back there in Numbers, they, they sinned against God and God sent. I think this is the scariest punishment in the Bible. God sent snakes to punish. I think snakes are terrifying creatures. Any there? Like that is not a good. Um, sometimes it's not just sin. Sometimes there's uh, sickness because of satanic attack. Sometimes for, um, for discipline. But hey, hear me. Sometimes there is sickness for the glory of God. They came upon a blind man and they said to Jesus, it's kind of funny, they act like he's deaf, not blind. Because they're standing right in front of him, they go, hey, who sinned? Hey, I can hear you guys. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but he was born this way that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. And Jesus then healed him. But I think one of the most important things is this. Whatever sickness is in your life, it exists partly to teach us to rely on God. Paul said, there was given me a thorn in the flesh and I've prayed three times, God, take it, God, take it, God, take it. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God said to Paul, they would not take it away and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That is when we think we are strong and we have it together, we rely on our strength, but sometimes God gets the greatest glory out of us when we're weak, when we're broken, when we're sick. Am I right? Um, amen. Look over, the, you know, look over there at Miss Abigail who comes in on crutches every week and gives glory to God. You bless me. You bless me see so many of you that God has gotten his greatest glory, not in your strength, but in your, your weakness. One of the promises we have in the Bible is that we've got a God that heals. I want to look at that. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 3 says, Bless the Lord who heals all of your diseases. Exodus 15, 26, after God had healed the waters at Marah, he said, I am the Lord, your healer. Psalm 30, verse 2, it says, I cried to the Lord. You ever do that? You ever cry to the Lord? I cried to the Lord for help, and he healed me. Psalm 47, verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Jeremiah 17, 14. I like this. It says, Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Which makes sense if you've been healed. Then you, anyway, it says, Heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 says, for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. What does that mean? That he rise? Does it mean that God has wings? Uh, they understood that to mean that on, um, when a Jewish man would dress, there were, there were tassels that he wore. And when the Messiah came, if you remember, there was a woman who saw the Messiah coming and she remembered that verse. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And she understood the wings to be the tassels that he would wear, and she went up and behind him touched the hem of his garment. You remember that? And just to find, um, let me ask this. Does God still do that? Does God still heal? Because Jesus was a healer. Healed the deaf and the blind. He healed the centurion servant. He healed the, um, the, the epileptic, the man of that son. Uh, he healed the man with dropsy. He healed 10 lepers. One came back, nine went on, he healed the demon-possessed, he healed the synagogue ruler's daughter, uh, healed Lazarus, big time. Healed Peter's mother-in-law. You know, that, that woman, thinking of those tassels as he went by, and she thought this, if I can just get to Jesus, things will be different. Well, look down there at James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone, is anyone among you suffering? Let him Send money to a TV preacher. Is that what it says? What does it say? Let him pray. Pray privately. The answer to trouble, James says, is prayer. And then he's just going to nail this home. Is anyone cheerful? Amen. Like, keep on with the sick preacher. <laughs> Any of you cheerful? What are you to do? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the church, and they will pray over him. He says, look, you pray privately. You pray with your church. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. I say, why does it say to use oil? Give you, uh, if you're taking notes, just write these down real quick. Number one, oil is a symbol in the Bible of the Holy Spirit. And the emphasis is this, that you don't heal, but God heals. And so you cannot heal. Hey, hear me. You cannot heal anyone 
God can heal at his will. And so you use oil to symbol. I think also oil is a symbol of our faith. Uh, I cannot give you, I, you can't see faith. And so it's a tangible symbol of faith. Also, often in the Old Testament, oil was a symbol that they would use when they would, when they would set a king aside. They would anoint that king with oil. It is as if saying, I am a child of the king. And I know that my identity is in Christ and I rest on him and what he can do. But now James says, just pray honestly. If he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and do what? Talk about it. Tell everybody, what. no, he doesn't say that. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power in its work as it is work. I like this line. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. Are your prayers working? They're working. Isn't that a great line? And he says, look, just pray simply. Just pray. You don't have to have, uh, look, look down there at verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I think the NIV says that. Elijah was a man just like us. And, and it means this, that, that we look at the miracles of Elijah, that we see fire called down from heaven. We see the dead raised, and we say, wow, what a great man Elijah was. And James stands up in the New Testament and says, no, it is not what a great man Elijah was. It is what a great God Elijah served. And the God that Elijah served, we still serve. He's still alive. So Elijah's been swept up into the heavens, and he's not here, but our God is still here. And the secret to Elijah wasn't that he was some kind of Samson or Hulk or superhero. Elijah's secret was that he, what's he say it is? Elijah was a man with a like nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three, three years and six months. It did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Go, well, if the truth of Scripture is that God does still heal, why do we sometimes doubt? I'll give you about three answers to that. Um, one, sometimes there's just guilters out there. You know, if you ju- you wouldn't be sick, and they just kind of guilt you. You ever felt this? If you, if you had enough faith, you wouldn't get sick. Well, everybody's eventually going to get sick and die unless you can. Am I right? Unless Jesus comes. Um, so it's not, a, it's not always about having an, enough, but they'll, they'll come to you and they'll tell you something, you know, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta have more faith, you know. In fact, if you'd had enough faith, you wouldn't have even gotten sick. Uh, then there's what I, um, it's not I call them, this is doctrine, but we call them the cessationist. Cessationist is, uh, cessationism is the view that the gifts ended with the era of the apostles, that God no longer works like that. Kind of like, by, by the way, if God doesn't work the way God works, you would need a new Bible to explain to you how God works. Because uh, the whole point of the Bible is to tell you how God works. Um, am I right? It's kind of like, like, does God still heal? You, you, you can imagine some saying today, well, you know, he used to. But you think God suddenly went, well, you know, I used to heal people, but not anymore. Wow, a lot of people got healed. My God was much stronger back then. Of course, anyway. Got any others? Yeah. Some people just doubt because of the showmen that are out there. Those that have made Christianity into a show instead of a matter of faith. And God becomes for them a commodity for their own self-gain that they look to gain from it. Uh, Remember in Acts chapter 8, there was a man there by the name of Simon the Sorcerer. It says that everybody was just blown away by his magic. Philip comes into Samaria. He preaches the gospel. And Simon is one of those who appears to have been converted. He follows Philip all around, and Peter comes in to pray over them. When Peter comes and he prays, the Holy Spirit comes down on that place. And Simon the magician, instead of being filled with the Spirit and giving glory to God, he stands back. He goes, wow, wow, that is good. I wish I could give the Holy Spirit. And he pulls Peter aside and says, hey, how much money can I give you so I can learn that trick? And you know what Peter says? Peter says, let your money perish with you. In other words, you understand you are about to perish. You are in danger at this moment of hell. He he looks at him and he says, you have thought to buy that which is the gift of God. You are trying to turn the Holy Spirit into a show and God won't have any of it. But those things, look, can I put it this way? Humans shouldn't cause you to doubt what God says. Sometimes they'll throw you off track, but they they really shouldn't cause you to doubt. Um, Does God still heal? I've seen God heal. Have you? 
Uh, sometimes we call it answered prayer requests, but I, I just started thinking through spe uh, specific examples. Uh, there's a guy right over here named Grover Fletcher, one of the pastors on our staff. Amen. Remember, what was it, a year ago? You were on hospice and we were praying for you? Hospice is you're getting ready to die. Are you still on hospice? No. He can't hear, but no. <laughs> I gave him life, not hearing. <laughs> well, amen. The guy uh, a while back uh, came and said, his name was Vince. He said, you, he was, he was desperate. He said, you have to pray for me. There, they, they did these, they, and they, they found a spot on my lung. And I said, I'll pray for you. I started praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. Go up to the cross, I prayed for him. He said, hey, weeks later, what's up with that, that spot on your lung? He said, honestly, oh, funniest thing. He said, they did the scans again, and it's not there. I guess they misunderstood the scans. And I said, well, or maybe, am I right? Maybe it's... Um, 2012, a little girl named Anna drowned, and God gave her life again. You know them. You know these people. These are, these are um, 2008, there was a girl named Hannah who was getting weak. She, uh, she was 12 years old. She was getting weak and, and was like, why am I suddenly like, losing strength when I go out running? And they took her to the doctor. The doctor sent her to Loma Linda. Loma Linda said, there's a mass in your, in your brain. They gathered the neurology team and a cardiac team that said, all of this is related. And we prayed. I remember looking at my friend Matt and seeing the desperation in his eyes. They'd already lost a child and it said, I can't lose another child. I remember praying desperately. They were getting ready for surgery. They said, let's just do one more scan. They did one more scan and they couldn't find the mass. Isn't that great? That's the way they got, got uh, tell you my favorite and go, I, I've told you this a thousand times, but um, I'll tell you one more time because I like telling it. Um, you know the Bible says to speak often of his wonders? Remember Jed and Dovey's a marine couple in, in this church getting the desperate call from Dovey that said Jed was backing out. And when he backed out, he ran over little Jordan. And she was terrified. And they rushed her by ambulance to the hospital. The hospital airlifted her out of there. Remember driving down Highway 62. And this mom was just praying. You know what she prayed? You know what you pray when you're in that situation? You don't pray eloquent words. You pray simply, you say this. She said, oh God, help me. 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 And you breathe for a moment and then you say, oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. Oh God, help me. We got there. I know Senator pulled up toward the hospital. She jumped out of the car and ran into the hospital to go find her child. Jed and I went to find parking. Got in there. We did the typical waiting. We finally said, hey, you can come on back. And went back there, and um, Debbie was holding Jordan. Is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. She wasn't okay a little bit ago when the car ran over her, but she's fine. After a little bit, a nurse comes in, and they said, we're looking at the charts, and we think maybe he didn't run over the baby because there's no indication that the baby was, was touched. And Debbie said, no, 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 he ran over the baby. And she said, no, no, there's no indications on the charts. And she reached, and she pulled back the baby's gown. I was right there when this happened. And there were tire marks across the baby's um, skin, and yet no damage to the, to the child. Does God still heal? Does God still do miracles? Yes. But here's the thing. God is not a formula. God is not the, God, hey, sometimes God heals and sometimes you get to go to heaven. That's the way, am I, am I right? Um, so you put it in the hands of God. Can I just give you some pastoral encouragements? When you come to a text like this, it's one of those moments that you just need shepherding from a pastor. Any of these encouragements when it comes to healing and things like this, I think the most important thing James would say to us, would say to me, to say to you, is to focus on prayer. Focus on prayer. He says, pray privately, pray with your church, pray honestly, pray simply, but pray. Look down there at verse 13. Is anyone sick? Let him. And what is the answer? Let him pray. Verse 14, let him call on the elders of the church and they will pray. Verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Look down there at verse 16. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Look again at verse 16. The prayer of the righteous person is of great power. Look at verse 17. Elijah 
prayed. Look at verse 18. Elijah again prayed seven times. James said, and that's that one little passage, just in case you don't get it. If you didn't understand, pray. He says again, pray. He says, pray, 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 pray. That the overwhelming emphasis of this text is, yes, you've got a God that's prays, but you're supposed to have a people who pray also. Or you've got a God who heals. You've got supposed to have a people who pray. Remember, um, I love this song. Remember this old song? Went like this. I'm not going to sing. So some of you got excited. Like, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Remember the next line? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? I think so. We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. What's it say, church? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised, thou will all our burdens bear. I absolutely love that. And how does it start? What a friend we have in Jesus. The Son of God come to care about us. He said, and here's the great emphasis of that song. You've got a God that you can talk to when the world caves in on you. you say, but what about those times? I mean, you, you come and you say, hey, we've got a great God who heals, and not only a God that healed in the Old Testament, a, a God who healed through Jesus, a God who healed using Peter and Paul and John, and a God who all through history has healed. What about the times that I gave it to God? I prayed, I sought the Lord, I prayed fervently. I was like Dovey in that car praying, God help me, God help me, God help me, and God didn't heal. What, what about those times? Um, I think people in the Bible that didn't get healed. John the Baptist didn't get healed, did he? He died. Uh, Paul had the thorn in the flesh. And instead of God healing him, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Remember Uzziah, the king, got leprosy? God never took that leprosy away. Remember uh, after he wrestled, Jacob had the limp all his life. He'd walk with that limp. God never took away the limp. I just wrote down, if, if I can put it this way, some don'ts. Just that's the moment, I think, when there are prayers in your life that are unanswered. That's a moment that you need to be very careful spiritually. Go, hey, don't, don't, there's some places that, some temptations that you need to be, God, um, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. You know, God doesn't always answer quickly. Amen? And sometimes we quit. Jesus said, you be like a persistent widow that bothered a judge every day. You just keep praying. The Old Testament says, give God no rest. I just want to say, um, when God doesn't do what you want God to do, don't get angry with God. God's plan, hey, here is great advice to God's church, to us. God's plan is better than your plan, always. But often, it feels like my plan is better than God's plan. Now, that sounds like, yeah, that's kind of right when it's involving your career. When it's your wife, it feels different. When it's your kid, it feels different. When it's your health, it feels different. And to submit to the will of God and not be angry is important to your life. Martha looked at Jesus when he came to, and Lazarus had already died. And what did she say? She's mad. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Um, I think you should not assume that God is angry with you, but you should check in. Does that make sense? Don't assume God's angry with you, but you should check in. Don't get bitter. Somebody died, and you prayed, and you had prayed, and you had prayed. And some people get bitter at God. That's where they walk away from their faith. That's where they lose their, their hope. I, I also think it's important that you don't stop rejoicing with those who are healed because you didn't receive the healing you wanted. Um, there, I was reading a book, a big book, uh, by Craig S. Keener. He's a theologian. So it's a book of theology on the doctrine of healing. And Keener's phenomenal. He is solid. He's also, the point of this book was he's been all over the world as a theologian and just seeing God do some stuff. And this book on miracles, it was a great big book on miracles, which is documenting miracle after miracle after miracle. I stopped reading for a while. Because, you know, 
<laughs> you lose some people in your life, and I just thought, Lord, this became the prayer of my life. Lord, give me the ability to rejoice with those who rejoice. Um, that you don't, you don't quit. Ever um, go, well, how does this work? How is it that I go and I get healing from God? Can I point something out? Every Say yes, because it's my sermon I'm going to. Um, <laughs> have you ever noticed every time Jesus healed, there was no formula? He healed different every single time. One time he, he spit in the ground and made mud. You would think that would scare everybody away from ever coming back, right? Like, don't go to Jesus for healing. Like, there's this spit thing. And um, sometimes, he, sometimes he just used his voice. He would run inside the tomb and touch Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Um, sometimes it was just his touch. It's a blind man he takes by the hand and he takes him outside and he touches him. It's absolutely beautiful. Every time God heals in the Bible, it's to, uh, one time Moses used a tree. Another time Moses used a serpent on a, on a, on a pole. Elisha used dirty water. In fact, um, in the book of Kings, they throw a dead body into Elisha's tomb and the dead man comes out alive. It doesn't always happen, only happened once. And um, in Acts 19, it says that Paul used handkerchiefs and aprons. And um, sometimes people will take one of those symbols and they kind of run away with it like, this is the answer. Especially uh, faith people, faith, faith teachers that are trying to get money from you. Years ago, I was preaching um, on healing, and I said to Rebecca, wouldn't it be fun to just collect up all the gimmicks and gadgets at these? And so this is what she did, was she just called, you know how they have those 1-800 call here and we'll send you our whatever it is? She called them all. And uh, we got this box that we just collected of stuff. My favorite was this, this, this group said, if you send us money, we didn't send them any money, but they said, if you send us money, we'll send you a prayer rug and you'll bow down and you'll pray and God will heal you. So uh, we asked for the prayer rug, gave, gave them no money. What we got, I don't know if you got something better if you gave money, but uh, what you got was a piece of paper it was about this big. Apparently, small people are meant to, to pray on the, the prayer rug. Um, you know what I notice? It's not about prayer rugs. It's not about every time. Every time God does it different. Imagine the early church, and they get together, and all the people that have been healed, they're in a room. They say, let's start a healing ministry. And the man with the withered hand says, you know, the way we got to do it, Jesus healed. He healed by touch. We've got to touch people. And the woman who had had the hemorrhage said, no, no, you got to grab his tassels. That's how he heals. You got to grab his tassels. And, and the blind man said, no, no, you, you got it all wrong. You got to spit in their eye. That's the way it works. You spit in their eye and then they're, they're healed. And, you know, before it's over, you got three denominations. You got the first church of the spitters, the first church of the tassel grabbers, and the first church, am I right? The first church of the word sayers. You know why it's different every time in the Bible? Because God doesn't work by a formula. It's not, hey, get this. It wasn't the aprons that Paul used that healed anybody. It was God who healed. It wasn't the dirty water that healed anybody. It was God who healed. Uh, all through the Bible, the emphasis, it wasn't the tree at Mara that made the water sweet. It was God, look, God used the tree. God used the apron. God used the spit. But the point throughout is this. You never trust a formula. That's why James doesn't send us running to formulas. Do this thing and make this dance and do this and get this gimmick and all of that. Throw away every gimmick you have. James says, toss all the gimmicks and get rid of all of that and do this one thing. Pray to God. And he hears you. You've got a God who cares about you and loves you and stands as your, your friend. There's one more little pastoral. Focus on prayer. It means when God doesn't heal, don't turn to gimmicks and things like that. You rely on the Lord. But I think that you, that this is just key to the text is James is also saying that we need to address sinful behavior honestly. We need to deal... Um, James says, look, Christians, when you're dealing with suffering, sickness, sin, that there should be prayer, there should be confession, and there should be intervention. See that down there in the text? Have you ever thought about what we owe the world and then what we owe each other? I just, as, as a pastor, was just thinking, man, what do we owe the world? Meaning, what, what do we as a church, what is Palms Baptist Church, what do you as believers of Jesus, what do we owe the world? We owe them nothing. You're wrong. We owe them a lot. Um, we owe the world the clarity of the gospel. 
that never once is the church to muddy the waters of the message of Jesus Christ, that we are to preach clearly that man is sinful and rebellion to God, but we have a God who has come down to rescue us from our sins, and if we will repent, he will save us. Uh, we owe them that. We owe them the word preached accurately. Not what the preacher's opinion is, but what, it, and listen, you owe them the authenticity of the Christian life lived out. You owe that to them. You owe it to your co coworkers to show them what a Christian life looks like. Uh, that's what you owe the world. You ever think about what is the church just pulling out of this text? What does the church owe one another? What, what do we owe each other in this room, in this, this church? Well, James lists some things. He says, hey, you owe this to each other. You owe it to one another to listen to sins be unburdened. And sometimes we get a little scared about, so I don't want to, don't, don't tell me your sin. I don't want to hear it. Because sin is icky stuff. You can quote me on that. Sin is icky stuff. Um, you see that? It says down there, you confess your sins to one another. Because sometimes it's sin that causes sickness, suffering. There is, there is power in exposing sin because it destroys the darkness that you're living in. What you look for in a church is you don't go share with everybody. Let me tell you what I did, because everybody in the room is not safe. Amen? So how do you know? Because I invite unsafe people. You do too. But you will find as you walk in a church, as you go to Bible studies, as you walk together, you'll find people in that church that are spiritually safe. They don't gossip, they don't talk, but they'll pray with you and they'll weep with you over your sin. And that's what you want is that person that's not gonna give you a pass on it, like, oh, that's what upset you? That's not a big deal. And kind of slap you on the back. No, no, no. You want that person to say, wow, that's terrible. I grieve with you over that. Let me pray for you. And they don't go talk to everybody else, but they walk beside you. They don't judge you. But not only do we owe it to one another to confess sin and hear sins confessed, hey, hear me, we owe it to each other to intervene when someone strays away from the Lord and into sin. Uh, and that gets real, people get kind of nervous about that in the modern church. Like, whoa, we don't say anything. Like, like uh, the modern church is just very, hey, don't, don't judge. Well, it's not my place to tell you, hey, you don't go to somebody and go, hey, you're going to hell. Okay. But, but is it ever our place to say, whoa, are you okay? Look down there at verse 19. You're like, there was more of James. Yeah. My brothers, if anyone wanders from the truth, Modern church, oh, it's not my business. I, I, I'm not going to say anything. That, that's between them and the Lord. My brothers, if any one of you should wander from the truth, and then what does James say? And someone, someone brings him back. Hey, come here, are you okay? Can we talk? James says, look, if somebody wanders from the truth, call them back. Call them home. We say, hey, oh, I, I don't want to impose my values on them. Please don't impose your values on them. My request of you as your pastors, do not impose your values on other people. But it is never wrong to express what the biblical value is. Because there are some things, look, I've got an opinion about many things. Ask me, ask my kids, I've got a list. I've got many opinions, none of which ultimately, well, I think they matter. But as a church, we hold tight to that which is not ours. The word of God does not belong to me and it does not belong to you, it belongs to God. And it's not imposing our values on somebody when you express what the Bible clearly says. Uh, amen? Then you get quiet in here, like don't say anything, maybe I'll. Um, had a youth leader, I'm, I'm, he told me I could tell you this. Had a, had a youth leader, got a, this is years ago, got a message from the youth group that they were going to watch a movie. And the movie was a movie that was like, I, I called him aside, I said, hey, come here. I said, how is it my kids are about to watch a movie that's still in theaters? How'd you get it? And he kind of looked a little startled. He said, well, I mean, I, I downloaded it. So legally? You're about to, you're about to go in, into our church and legally show up. And at this point, his whole continent changed. He said, I, I never thought about it. He said, in fact, we do it so often, steal movies. We do it so often, I forgot it was a sin. And this young man starts weeping. It was beautiful. But what, what, what if nothing had ever been said? My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone bring him back, look at verse 20. Here's how James ends. Whoever brings back a sinner from wandering 
will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Hey, who loves you enough to call you back when you wander? Who, who has the boldness? Who loves you that much? Because the great, hey, hear me, and I'll, I'll try not to be too passionate when I say this, but the greatest thing God did for us is not what he does for your body and healing. The greatest thing God does for you is what he did for the soul in saving the soul that I am eternally rescued to heaven. That's the hope that I have. Thank God when the bodies heal. Um, lady and her son are coming to church, different church, not here. So it's been more than 20 years ago. I'm a young pastor of this little church. And she and her son are going to, coming to church together. He, he's an adult. And then I got to know them pretty well. But he just disappears. Just disappear. Everybody's kind of like, hey, don't, don't say anything. You know, Matt, 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 his name is Matt. Matt. Matt's back. He's back to drinking, back to drugs. Back, man, he just slid. He slid, backslid. Anybody say anything about it? No, no, no don't, don't talk to Matt about it. We talk to each other. Not, not to Matt. Remember his mom at a Bible study, she said, I, she's broken. She said, I wish somebody would say something. I said, I, w- I will. So I go out to the, the trailer where he lives. And you know how that is. You fight off the dog and go up there. I just knock loud on the door because I, I know. Bam, 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 bam. What? Who is it? I said, it's David. And there's this moment, just this long pause. You know what I want to do at that moment when he said, who is it? I want to go, Jehovah's Witnesses, and just run away. That's what I wanted to do. (laughs) It's David. And there's this pause. And then the door opens, and he just looks at me, and he starts weeping. And he comes down off the porch, and he just grabs me, and he hugs me, and he's holding on to me. And all the way over there, I'm thinking, what am I going to say to him? And I'm rehe- You ever do this? I'm, re- I'm rehearsing my words. I'm working through it. And the truth is, none of my words are what brought him back. He just needed one thing, to know that there was somebody out there that loved him in the midst of his hurting enough to say, you can come back to the Lord. You can come back to the Lord. Um, there are some people in your life that just want to know that you love them enough to bring them home. And we're so okay sometimes with each other wandering. Um, close with this, and then I'll just give you time at, at the altar. Those moments that God heals, God doesn't heal, can I tell you this? It is not about his love for you. God deeply loves you. So those that are healed, it's not that God goes, well, I love them a little more. You, I'm going to kick you in the face. Henry Blackaby in the book, Experiencing God, says, um, his daughter Carrie was sick with cancer. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed for her to get well. And one day he said to God, God, I'm so devastated by my daughter having cancer and you haven't healed her. In the midst of prayer, he said to God, God, do you love me? You ever wanted to say that to God? God, I'm down here pouring out my heart. This is my daughter. I love her so much. Do you love me? And he said, quickly, the words came to my heart from the Holy Spirit, and it was this. The Lord said to him, Henry, my love for you was settled on the cross. That's good, isn't it? The most important thing for you to know at a moment like this, yeah, you've got a God that heals. We've seen it. We've seen it in this congregation. It's an old guy right there that says, yeah, God heals. But... The most important thing is not that God heals the body. The most important thing is that God heals the soul. Hey, if any of you are wandering from God, it's time to come home. Not to people that would judge you, look down on you, but to people that deeply love you. Can I just give you time between you and the Lord here at this altar? Some of you, you, maybe you want to come and pray. God, there's somebody on my heart. My mom is so on my heart. My kids are so on my heart. This person's health is so on my heart. It's just James says, you come in your church and you pray. Some of you may be here that you'd say, I just need to come home to the Lord. I need to get down at the altar and I need to kneel down. And I say, God, I'm, I'm back. I need to come back. You came into this room. A lot of you came in heavy. Not as heavy as usual because you got an extra hour of sleep, but you still came in heavy. 
and you just need to lay burdens down at the altar. Can I give you time to do that? I would love to pray with you. Ryan would love to pray with you. Grover and Melinda would love to pray with you. Or you can just kind of ditch us and come straight to the altar. Run. Amen? Run to the altar. Would you stand? You come. Thank you for listening to the sermon. For further information or to get in contact with our church's ministries, please visit us at palmsbaptistchurch.com.